Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, botnets, everyone, welcome Mr. Colin Mulaney, also known as Nemo. He's going to come in today and he's actually going to come into shop inside this piece of tape here. Uh, and he's going to talk to you today about a billion dollar Android botnet, which uh, himself and a couple of um, security experts in Symantec found. Yep, that's Okay, it. thanks very much for coming along, Colin, and uh, yes, enjoy the talk. Much. Thank you. So, uh, give him a round of applause. <laughs> So my name is Colin Milani, I'm a software engineer with Symantec and I work in the security response lab based in Dublin and basically what we do in the response lab is we analyze and we investigate and reverse engineer viruses and other malware. So really what that means is we get in binaries and executables and then we're basically given them and we need to find out exactly what they do and how they work and that sort of thing. So say 90% of an analyst's job then is usually going to be with Windows malware so that's kind of what we do almost every day, day in and day out. But occasionally we come across uh, threats which target different platforms and they're usually the type of thing which we kind of find most interesting because they're not the, t the normal run of the mill type of malware. So this presentation that I'm about to give, it's on a piece of malware that we discovered in February of 2012. And this is actually the second or third time now I've given this presentation. I originally gave it at a uh, Virus Bulletin Conference that was in Berlin, Germany. So the actual malware that we looked at, it was designed to run on the Android operating system and it formed part of what we call a botnet. So my presentation then will give you an overview of Android's botnets and kind of botnet, botnet malware in general. After that, I'll go into a bit of depth on the actual uh, piece of malware that we discovered, which we named Beemaster. Um, I'll give some technical details about how the botnet actually worked, uh, what it did, and some of the motivations behind why the original author uh, created it in the first place. After that, then, I'll go through the revenue generation behind Beemaster itself. Um, I'm giving more information, obviously, on the actual um, ideas behind why the botnet was actually created in the first place. And then after that, I'll give a short demonstration of the command and control infrastructure that actually underpins the entire botnet, basically how it was controlled from a remote location. So then when we're talking about uh, botnets, what we really mean is just a network of devices which are all infected with the same malware. So in this case then, because we're talking about Android botnets, if you can imagine if we all had an Android device just like this, um, and we all happen to be infected with exactly the same piece of malware, and then all of our devices then were occasionally checking in with a remote server, which we call a command and control server. So when we say kind of checking in like that, we just mean basically it's communicating out to the server and then occasionally the server is sending back commands or maybe other pieces of information to all of our infected devices. So in that case then, you know, every one of our devices comprises the actual botnet. So why we think this is kind of interesting is that this type of malware is actually kind of trending on devices at the minute. It's a case where in emerging markets, where in places like maybe India or in this case China, you can get an awful lot of devices which are actually infected with this type of malware and maybe people don't really realize or they don't, there's not a lot of exposure in this type of malware infection. So shortly before I gave this original presentation, there was a big article in the news about the MDK botnet where people were basically describing that there was up to or there was an estimated one million devices in infected with this specific piece of malware. Now that's actually a little bit tricky to do with um, Android-based devices, it's, it's, it makes a really great headline, like you're just kind of scanning headlines and you see one million devices infected with X. Well, you know, I mean, it's probably a good indication of something that you might read. But in reality, it's quite difficult to get those type of accurate numbers because Android devices and Linux devices in general don't generally run antivirus software, so it makes it quite difficult to collect those type of metrics. But the reason Beemaster was kind of unique in that case then was it was a botnet that we managed to collect a lot of uh, very good telemetry data about. And so in that case then, we were able to make very accurate estimations, in fact, there weren't even really estimations at all, about the number of devices that were infected, uh, how much money was actually being generated by the botnet, how it worked, and you know, we basically were able to leverage quite a lot of data out of the botnet itself. So one of the reasons then why Android malware is so popular in these type of emerging markets is that there's been an absolute explosion in the amount of smartphones which are you know, cropping up in these, in say places again, like uh, China and India. And then we'll say in these type of markets, maybe 
something like Google Play isn't that popular, or maybe it's not even accessible to, let's say, a large amount of people, or possibly the software that's available in Google Play maybe isn't localized into those languages, which would be more popular in those specific regions. So in this case, then, what you end up with is kind of third-party marketplaces, which aren't exactly Google Play, but they look just like it really, when you kind of go and actually investigate them. But the main difference, then, between something, a third-party marketplace like that and something like Google Play is that Google, Google maintains a very strict set of standards for the type of software that they'll actually allow to be hosted on their uh, services. And they're also extremely diligent about investigating any kind of reports of malware or anything which basically goes against their hosting guidelines. So in this case then, something which would be taken down very, very quickly on Google Play can probably last for quite a long time on these third-party marketplaces if it's ever taken down at all. So this kind of leads on to what we talk about as kind of Trojanized applications, which again are these kind of, they're just normal applications which have possibly been localized to one of these local languages, but then while that was going on, someone inserted their kind of malicious code into the uh, APKs or the applications themselves, and then what they do is they just host them then on these third-party marketplaces. And, you know, that's kind of the infection vector for this type of malware. And it's also quite simple then to write very powerful malware for Android. The Android kind of um, programming model really supports the, the idea of low-profile daemon processes, which are basically just background processes which run in the background. They, they don't give very, any indication really at all that they're actually executing, but they can be extremely powerful. So this type of programming model is almost custom-made for uh, malware writers because it's basically exactly what they're looking for. <coughs> so another big issue then is that kind of today, the Android permission list is, is almost becoming like the software you love its day. It's something which most people just kind of ignore or they kind of, they don't fully understand. You know, it's just they kind of swipe through it, click through it, you know, they're not going to pay that much attention to it. They basically just want their application installed. So it's a case where, you know, they're just not paying that much attention. So that kind of plays into the bad guy's hands uh, completely. It's also quite simple to make revenue from these type of infected devices. So when we're talking about this type of um, economic model, we're not talking about kind of a smash and grab where they try to take a lot of money all in one go. What they're trying to do is take kind of micro payments from a device but, and then hope that that kind of flies under the radar of the actual infected um, device's owner. So you might be wondering then, well, if it's a case where they're only taking very small payments from a device, how do they make money? Well, that's where the, the kind of botnet comes into it. Again, if you can imagine that we're all infected, but like maybe we're only taking one euro per device. But when you begin to kind of scale out your botnet to hundreds, if not thousands, or in this case, hundreds of thousands of infected devices, that type of money begins to add up very, very quickly, depending on how like you actually harvest, we'll say, um, the micro payments from each device. Uh, another worrying trend is that mobile banking applications are actually on the rise. So we've seen a number of different uh, variants of malware where you have kind of a hybrid threat where you have maybe a piece of malware which is designed to run on a desktop PC. There's also a, another component which is designed specifically to run on a, a smartphone or mobile device. So this kind of uh, hybrid attack is, is very powerful if it actually succeeds because obviously you want to get malware onto a desktop PC, but then if you can also get it onto a, a um, mobile device, well then you have an even bigger kind of um, attack base to start exfiltrating data. So like in this case, imagine if a bank is actually doing some sort of two-factor authentication which your phone is registered into, you can see why someone would absolutely want uh, mobile devices infected as well. So now I'd like to kind of switch over into discussing the botnet that we actually discovered ourselves. Uh, we named it the Vmaster botnet, and as I said then, we first discovered it in February of 2012, and again it was being hosted on one of these third-party marketplaces which was operating out of uh, mainland China. So just to give you an idea then of the basic infection vector for this type of malware in those type of markets, you basically just have a smartphone user that contacts the App Store, they download one of these Trojanized APKs, again it's probably a legitimate application that's just been localized to, we'll say, uh, simplified Chinese, but also uh, contains the uh, malicious code that's um, designed to execute at the same time. So we'll say in this case then, when the smartphone user downloads, installs the app, accepts the permissions, 
um, the malicious code will then immediately reach out to this remote server that we're talking about, this command and control server, to register itself, saying, OK, I'm here. Uh, I've just infected this device. Tell me what I should do. So in this case, then, um, once the Trojanized APK registers with the CNC, the CNC then just begins to return more malicious uh, data back to the infected device. <coughs> So as we kind of went through a little bit of this, it's just this legitimate software that's, you know, that's been trojanized with this kind of malicious code. And in this case, the trojanized application was just basically the first stage in this wider malware attack. It was basically just a loader or a downloader for the next stages in the malware uh, lifecycle, what we usually call the payload. And then the payload actually comprised the, you know, the actual botnet specific code itself. So this then is a screenshot of the original application that we were looking at. Uh, as you can see then, you know, it's just a normal settings application, but it, um, the original version was just all in English. They just kind of took it, they translated various bits and pieces of it, and then they uh, added in their malicious code. But it's kind of important to note that every single thing that you see on the interface there works, you know, exactly as you would expect it to. Like, there's nothing really out of the ordinary about it whatsoever. But then, in reality, what it's actually doing is it's registering with the CNC. Uh, it's attempting to exploit the device. From there, it's going to try and uh, install more malware, and then it's immediate, immediately going to begin tracking the infected device. And what we kind of mean by that is it profiles the device completely. It basically takes a fingerprint of all of the information associated with the device that it's, it's kind of interested in. And that's everything from current geographical location, current mobile carrier, uh, phone number, all this type of information, email addresses even. It just fingerprints the device and sends it back to the CNC and saying, you know, this is who I am, this is where I am. Uh, tell me what I should do. And then, as we were kind of talking about then, the main uh, motivation behind all of this is basically just to end up charging the user for uh, specific um, services. So when the original sort of downloader loader component actually executed, the first thing it did was, if any of you have maybe done some Android programming, you probably know that you can have resources in the uh, application packages, the APKs for Android. So the first thing it did was it would just decrypt these uh, resources using AES, and then from there it would just pull out a URL string. Now, in the very first uh, piece of malware I looked at, there were a number of different resources with these URL strings. They were all kind of both pointing back to the, basically the same IP. But um, it's kind of important just to remember that there were always fail safes kind of written into the APKs themselves, so that there was always kind of a, a redundancy there if, if necessary. So once then this URL was um, decrypted, connect out to it, it would uh, attempt to download, uh, at the time, the gingerbreak exploit. So even when I was kind of first looking at this, gingerbreak was, was quite old at the time, but um, the author obviously realized it was still worthwhile to at least attempt that type of exploit, because if the exploit succeeded, he could then just begin to sort of install as much kind of software or extra malware as he wanted onto the device. But even if it was a case where the exploit failed, which it did, in, in, even in you know, the few tests that I kind of ran with it, it would still then attempt to download the next step in the payload. And then from there, it would execute that. But in the case of the non-exploited device, you would still see, we'll say, the permissions, or the, uh, the list of permissions that you needed to accept to allow the, uh, the malware to actually run. So, yeah. so the next stage then of the actual malware pay payload was a remote administration tool, or a RAT. And again, this is exactly what you probably think it is. It's just a way to administer uh, specific devices from remote locations, but it's, it's a very well-known kind of technique of uh, malware authors to you know, attempt to get this type of uh, software onto infected devices, so that they can kind of come back to it at a later time. And then, as soon as that sort of part of the cycle had been complete, it would then, the RAD itself would register with the CNC, and then the CNC would take all of the information from the registration, like we said, the geographical location of the carrier, and it would assign it to basically a configuration channel. And this was just, we'll say, a subset of the infected devices that he knew about that performed to specific criteria. And again, most of the time, this type of criteria was just something that he knew he could definitely make uh, revenue out of. So again, just viable revenue streams, more or less. So then the RAD itself, as soon as it began execution, it just kind of registered a few different services. It had a few broadcast filters and, um, sorry, broadcast receivers and then temp filters. And then these services were usually used to kind of generate revenue from the bot monster. So the way he kind of went about this was 
it was quite unique. I hadn't really seen it before. What he had done was, again, he was kind of operating out of mainland China. And what he had done was he had registered a number of these premium pay services all throughout China, or at least in the areas he was most interested in. And he would have, like, let's say, a specific premium phone line number, a specific premium SMS service, and he also had a number of um, pay-per-view video sites. So again, like, it was a case where he was expecting, you know, the affected devices then to send, we'll say, a text message to one of these premium SMS services or connect out to one of these premium phone lines and that sort of stuff. But he also had a number of really interesting ideas in order to kind of prevent anyone who just kind of gave a cursory glance at the phone of actually noticing that this was going on, we'll say, before they actually received their bill. So one of the one of the funniest things I actually came across while I was first looking into this was when the phone would attempt to make a phone call out to one of these, we'll say, these premium chat services that he had set up. And what he would do was he would save the current state of the microphone and the speaker, and he would save that, and then he would mute both the microphone and the speaker and then attempt to make the call. And then as soon as the call, we'll say, uh, expired its time slice or, you know, basically it had executed for as long as he wanted it to, he would disconnect the call and then restore the speaker and the microphone. And again, it was just a case where he obviously wants to make sure that no one's going to have their phone sitting there and then suddenly you hear something strange coming out of the, the speaker, but he also wants it to be reset. So the next time you pick it up, you know, you're not going to notice, wait, why is my phone suddenly muted? I don't remember doing that. Uh, so he had kind of a lot of these tricks, like, and we'll say if the phone was suddenly woken up in the middle of one of these phone calls, well then he would immediately disconnect the phone call and then restore everything to the way it should be. So again, he's basically just trying to make sure that his infection stays on these devices for as long as possible because that's his kind of, that's his kind of long game. It's, it kind of goes back to what we were saying that he's not in it for a smash and grab, he's basically trying to stay on the device as long as possible and just not kill the golden goose. And so, so similar functionality to that then is he's also going through his kind of made call log. He's going to delete any, uh, any records of calls that went out to any of these numbers. And he also had functionality which was written into to the RAS to actually delete text messages. So he kind of had a lot of specific keywords that he was interested in deleting. Um, so maybe anything which could potentially come back from these services, anything which could maybe come back from the customer service lines because in China, again, they have, this is a, actually quite a huge problem, these infected devices just kind of sending out these random text messages to these uh, premium services. So they do have some anti-fraud detection techniques, but it was a case where he would then set it up so that any text message which is coming into the phone which has anything like that that he thinks might be a little bit worrisome or something which he is coming back from a well-known customer service number, he just basically going to block it and delete the messages so you know you basically never see it. Again, he's just trying to stay on the devices for as long as humanly possible. Um, and then obviously the RAD itself is, is going to be polling the command and control server every you know every so often for um, new commands. So again, he just has a few uh, different timers set up and he basically says at this time of the day, you know, connect back to the CNC, just say do you have anything new for me to do? Yes, no, you know, that sort of stuff. So yeah. So this is unfortunately a very small extract of the RAT code itself. Uh, it basically just shows the profiling that we were talking about, uh, where it's kind of going through the phone, it's pulling out various different uh, pieces of information in preparation to kind of send it back to you. Did um, he have anything to catch the actual activities from popping up on screen so that maybe make the calls happen in the background so that the user, if they glance at their phone, they wouldn't see the fact that someone's calling? Yeah, yeah, exactly, right. So again, it's a case where he doesn't want the phone to light up when he's making a phone call or anything like that. So again, he had a lot of kind of filters in place to make sure that, we'll say, um, he would be able to catch these type of things before it shows anything to, we'll say, the end user. Again, the whole idea is basically just to keep, uh, keep the user from ever suspecting that there's anything going on at the phone. Yeah. <coughs> uh, yeah, so this is just kind of a general graphic on basically what's going on with the malware once it's on the infected uh, devices. Again, the kind of control server, it's kind of issuing commands to the device. That's not even really true. Really what it did was it basically created uh, configurations and then rather than issue specific commands as in phone this now, it would basically just send back a configuration and say, okay, well this is what you're doing from now on. You know, we'll say in 20 minutes, make sure that you connect to this and then if that fails, tell me about it. So that was, a, that was kind of a, a, a big thing about the, um, 
the modeler in general, there's a huge amount of error reporting even. I mean, he wants to know, okay, well, you know, was the device exploited successfully? Did you make that phone call successfully? You know, did you receive a reply back? Did you receive anything back from customer service from this specific um, <coughs> that sort of thing? So we'll say in this case then, the command control server is issuing out its updated configuration, the, the device is contacting these premium services, and then eventually the affected, infected device is going to be charged, and eventually this will all lead back to the original author of the malware, who again has registered all these services you know, in his name, and he's able to kind of tie that back uh, in order to get paid. Basically. So the way these kinds of services tend to work in, in China is they tend to be location and carrier specific. So we'll say you need a, you probably have a general purpose telephone number, and then from there you have a specific SMS short hold, which is specific to this uh, carrier in this part of China. So we'll say in the Yangming province or something like that. So he needs quite a few of these services or these, these short holds set up so that he can maximize his profits. Um, because again, you know, he doesn't want to kind of get a lot of devices that he just can't do anything with. So you know, he's basically casting as wide a net as, as possible. <clears throat> so again, this was all kind of during a fairly standard day uh, in the office. But towards the end of my shift then, I had kind of just begun to look at the actual climate control server part of it as well. Most of the time, like we kind of restrict ourselves to looking through source code or assembly code or something like that. But in this case, I just happened to take a very quick look at the command control server itself. I was expecting the entire thing to be completely locked down. But as it turned out, uh, the command control servers themselves were extremely poor, poorly secured. So it was a case where as soon as you kind of connected out to their uh, web addresses that were you know, uh, hard-coded into the actual bot itself, we were suddenly presented with a huge amount of data, if you know what I mean. So like, it was kind of a a configuration panel for the actual botnet itself. Um, so obviously this was great for us because we could see straight away all of these devices, you know, what was actually going on, how he was controlling everything. But unfortunately for me, it was coming up to, we'll say, the end of my shift. And the way we work in Symantec is, if you're working on something, you're supposed to hand it over at the end of your shift, unless you want to kind of stay and, you know, do overtime or whatever. So there are a lot of, at the end of my shift, trying to find anyone who read Chinese who could come over and translate all this stuff to me so we could actually, you know, kind of continue on with what we were doing. So as we kind of looked then at the uh, command and control in interface, we saw that he was maintaining data on all of the infected devices, on the infection rates, and he was also maintaining data on the successful revenue generation. And this kind of feeds back to what I was saying earlier. This type of data is really hard to, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to get very accurate data on, this, on these types of infections. So like when you kind of find something like this and it's all out in the open, we can just kind of read through it to find you can understand it. Um, you know, you get uh, a really great picture of the overall uh, botnet and how it actually works. So, as I was kind of looking through the command and control infrastructure then, we were trying to kind of piece together a rough timeline and we realized that he was probably running this botnet from September 2011 uh, up until we are not really sure because shortly after obviously we started investigating this then you know we, we occasionally do write up some blog posts in the uh, security response lab. So we published a blog on this, and uh, then I think maybe two days after our blog went public, uh, I had to recheck the server, and then suddenly I was I was locked out. There was you know username, password fields were all set up, and he had basically obviously clocked that we were at least looking at him, and he had kind of pieced together that it was him that was actually you know starting to get a little bit of interest. And then I think maybe two weeks after that, so uh, yeah, sir. Um, when when was that? No, this was 2000, this was actually February, February of 2012. So <coughs> nearly what, six months? Yeah, roughly six months. So, but again, it was almost kind of dumb luck that we happened to somebody, <coughs> like it was a case where I just said, oh, okay, well, this is, you know, this is all we found, and I'm not gonna do any more, and we can just leave it. If we had never bothered to write up about it, he would have been able to just kind of keep going. So we'll say two weeks then after he began to put in even um, very simple, protection around his configuration panels, um, the IP itself went dark completely. So one of the features that we saw within the malware itself was that it was, it was very simple for him to basically just rehome all of the infected devices to just point to a different IP. So what we figured was, he, what he probably did in those intervening two weeks was he just basically moved his infrastructure to a new host. He updated all the clients and then, you know, happy days, he's off again. You know, and, you know, he's not gonna have any more issues really from us. So, 
Yeah, so while I was kind of investigating the server then, we found that he actually had a number of different versions of his uh, malicious software. So again, he wasn't, this wasn't something that he threw together over the weekend and just fired out you know, to, um, to try to make it you know, some very quick money. It was something that he had been developing over time. And you could see it because he was versioning it like this is version one and it has only like very basic functionality. And then we'll say he was up to, I think, version six or something like that. And he had basically just been adding services, 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 more and more geographical locations, more and more, S more, and more SMS shortcodes. So like you could almost see a kind of progression where he was saying, okay, is this worth my time doing? Yes, it absolutely is. I'm going to keep doing it and I'm going to expand on my net as far as I possibly can so I get even more effective devices and I can potentially make uh, more money. <coughs> but even when we looked at him, he had basically hundreds of thousands of infected devices, which were at least connecting back to his website every single day, just kind of checking in and saying, okay, this is, this is me, this is what, what I'm doing, do you have anything for me to do today? That sort of stuff. So one of the kind of key points then was all of these, of all of these infected devices, not all of them were actively making him money but it wasn't a case where anything which didn't fit his specific criteria, he was just kind of throwing away the data. He always kept them kind of online, he always kept them checking in, he never kind of removed his malware, but this kind of made perfect sense. It's a case where if he has, we'll say, uh, 10,000 10, devices, but only 5,000 of them kind of making money today, well then if he puts in a little bit more of his infrastructure, well maybe he can get, we'll say, 2,000 of the remaining 5,000 to actually begin to make some cash. So he's always going to keep these devices which aren't currently actively making him money. So eventually, like, he'll hopefully you know, try to activate them. So you get these kind of sleeper cell phones. <coughs> so as I mentioned then, all of the infected devices were broken up into these configuration channels. And then the channels allowed the botnet master, the attacker basically, just to manage all of these devices. Because again, he's talking about hundreds of thousands of devices, so he doesn't want to have to you know, write up specific configurations for each one. He wants to break them up into subdivisions. And he knows, we'll say, this um, this set of devices are in Mongolia, and they're all on um, one of China's two biggest uh, mobile carriers. So again, he wants to be able to configure all of these things really, um, really quickly. And this, these channels let him do that because all he had to do was basically just describe the configuration and then send it out to a channel. And then all of those specific devices would receive the configuration and they'd update themselves. So, he was also then able to kind of execute a massive amount of kind of fine-grained control over these infected devices with just a few clicks on a, like a really simple HTML uh, interface. It was a case where he could even kind of set it to the time of day that he wanted the devices to attempt to um, make one of these revenue-generating uh, connections and pretty much anything he could think of more or less. Okay, so now I think I'll just switch over and I'll give you a quick look at what I saw then that Thursday evening, I think it was, when I first began looking at the, um, the infected website itself. So as soon as I connected out to the uh, command and control server URL, this is kind of what I saw. Now, at first glance, you know, it's, it's not that descriptive of actually what's going on. But as I said, I had a few colleagues who were able to um, translate it for me and we kind of went through it and we realized you know, exactly what it was that was going on. So, as we mentioned then earlier, um, what you tend to get is these SMS shortcodes which are associated with a carrier and a specific geographical region. Now, because this man was operating out of uh, mainland China, these are all kind of uh, SMS shortcodes for specific provinces in China. So just to kind of go through then what each of the columns uh, mean, we'll say this ID number is just an ID, and then this is the name of the channel. So you can see even he has some actual in English words where he's obviously just kind of setting up his channels to test them. Okay, is this going to work if they connect out to these specific phone numbers or uh, URLs or whatever else? Um, then this column here basically says, is this channel currently active? Are these devices allowed to connect out to whatever? So again, this kind of comes back to him kind of fine tuning the way his botnet is actually going to run. And again, it just kind of shows you the amount of control that he was able to execute over all of these devices. This column here then just kind of gives you the payload, like um, whether it's a SMS, is it a phone call, or this, which is the IVR, or is it a WAP2 kind of pay-per-view video um, connection that he wants the infected devices to actually try to make. 
And then this is just the, the specific carriers that the devices are um, currently on. So there are two main carriers in mainland China. They're Unicom and China Telecom. And for the most part, that's what he focused on. As far as I know, there is only Unicom and Telecom in this specific list. But again, he obviously had it in his mind that, okay, well, if it, you know, if it eventually becomes worth my while to support these, for say, maybe less known carriers, I definitely can. And it's, it's a case where he was kind of, he was almost kind of setting up for it. I mean, he basically started with the two most popular, but like, you know, he wasn't restricted to that by any means. This column here then just gives you the actual telephone numbers that it's going to send an SMS to or uh, make one of these phone calls to. And then this number over here is kind of important for uh, Chinese, tele uh, Chinese carriers because that's the phone number for the customer service line. So again, what this column basically says is, are these devices allowed to contact or be contacted by customer service? And then this kind of comes back to, you know, as we kind of mentioned earlier, those anti-fraud uh, detection techniques that they might have. You know, um, are we going to allow them to make a phone call out to the customer service number? Are we going to allow customer service to actually send us a text message saying, uh, maybe your device is infected, did you mean to phone this number for, you know, uh, two minutes or whatever? Something like that. And then this is the supported version of the actual bot. So you can see yourself then that he actually has a number of different versions of the bot that he's basically going to restrict sp uh, specific channels to. So maybe in this case for the video, maybe it's you know really only kind of supported on much newer versions of the bot, and he's going to just kind of test it out while he's you know while he's trying it. Um, these two comments here basically just allow him to immediately either edit or delete the specific configurations. And then these are the actual <coughs> provinces of mainland China. So this top one here, as far as I remember, is Liaoning in, um, in China. And as you can see then, he has them kind of broken up into the, you can see that there's kind of the repeating characters. So he obviously has it broken up into uh, various different uh, geographical locations. And then down here, this very big long string, if you translate it, it's actually, it's, it's almost like a kind of a, a catch-all, so like a default in a tri case or something. It's a case where he's basically saying, I want Shanghai, I want Mongolia, I want uh, Han province, basically as many as possible. So this is his kind of last ditch. If, if they don't fit into anything else, well, I'll just throw them into this bucket and then you know, uh, we'll go from there. And then we'll say this final column here allowed him to immediately update the, the geographical location. So again, it's kind of this fine grained control um, that he was able to exercise over all of these infected devices. So then just to give you an idea, of the type of configuration that he was able to set up for the infected devices. <coughs> so we'll say in this case then, this is his you know, main configuration panel. And it, as you can see, like there's something really complicated about like, what he's doing. He can just kind of do this in a few seconds and set it up any way he wants to really. So again, he's got his ID up at the top and then the name of the specific channel. Over here, this is the number that he's going to get the devices to send out text messages to. And then this is his SMS shortcode, which basically says, you know, um, when something comes to the service, this is who eventually gets paid. And this kind of comes back to how he had to break everything up because he needed these specific shortcodes. So these two columns here, then, or these two rows here, they basically say, on the first day, send two text messages. But then from then on, only send four text messages maximum per month. And this makes perfect sense if you think about it. So he's probably his greatest revenue yield is going to be on the first day that the devices get infected. So he's going to try and send two messages straight away, you know, we'll say to maximize his revenue. But after that, then he immediately scales back because again, the idea is that, okay, you want to make as much money as possible, but like the best way to do that is to remain on the infected devices for as long as possible. And if you don't kind of go crazy about it, you know, you have a much better chance of actually remaining on the infected devices. So he basically just limits it then, don't send any more than four in, uh, in the first month. These up here are global maximums, so he actually had, we'll say, an absolute max of what the infected device could eventually send. I'm not really sure why he did that. And then over here on the right-hand side is um, times of day that he would allow um, that he would allow these text messages to be sent. So as you can see then, he's gonna send it basically any hour of the day, he doesn't care, just you know, uh, kind of go ahead and send it whenever. So we'll say over here on the right hand side, these are specific keywords 
that is interested in filtering out any text messages which come into the phone which contain these keywords. So we'll say here, this is uh, 101, I think it's called, is uh, the Chinese currency. So he's basically saying anything which comes into the phone with that specific keyword in it, uh, don't allow it to come through, delete it, um, and make sure, you know, again, just trying to make sure that the owner of the device doesn't realize it. And this kind of makes sense. If you think about it, if you're going to send an SMS to one of these premium services, well, then in a lot of cases, it'll, you'll immediately get a, a text message back that says, um, by sending a message to the service, you're going to be charged one euro. So in this case, then, he's basically just filtering out that kind of um, message which would potentially come back from these services. And then down here, right at the very bottom, you can kind of configure, is, are these devices allowed to connect out to the customer service uh, numbers or not? <coughs> so then just to look at two other fields. So this is for the IBOR, which again, is just like a, it's just like a premium voice line. I can't remember what the OR stands for. It's interactive voice something. I want to say service, but it doesn't make sense. So again, then this is the phone number that the device is going to make a call out to. So these phone lines are usually charged per minute, um, but they're uh, usually charged per minute, but they're always charged on the amount of time that you actually spend connected to the service. So you can see in this case then that he's going to try and remain connected for 80 seconds, and this kind of comes back to we'll say the um, anti-detection techniques that we were talking about earlier, like. You know, it's going to mute the microphone, speakers, various things like that to make sure that the, uh, the end user doesn't actually realize that the phone call is being made. So this is the same as what we were looking at earlier. It's a case where it's basically saying, okay, well, you can't make any phone calls out from this device between 0 and 3 a.m. I'm not really sure why he did that. Uh, they seem like pretty good hours to me to actually make those type of phone calls. But um, maybe he was testing something. I'm not quite sure. And then the last payload that he actually supports. This is for a pay-per-view video service that they have in China. So this is actually something which is extremely popular in China. It's not so much popular, we'll say, in this part of the world. But what it is, it's just a service, just like YouTube, where you have individual contributors. And what they do is they upload content to these uh, accessible video sites. But in certain situations, then you can kind of say, okay, well, anyone who connects to this video is going to be charged for um, for the privilege of you know viewing my video. So basically, all he was doing, and we had a very quick look at some of the, the links. They were just kind of dummy files that he um, he would upload, and then obviously there's a charge associated with connecting to it. And this is the specific URL then that the phone will use to connect out to these um, specific video sites. So then, so how much money then do we think this guy was actually making? So we mentioned then that uh, it was a case where we said that we knew straight away that he had hundreds of thousands of devices connected to his botnet at any one time. So this is kind of a snapshot of the actual week. I was first looking at this uh, specific Botnet, and you can see this again just a chart for its own convenience, just to say how many, you know, what are my infection rates like uh, today? How many devices have been uh, infected? And this is basically just a raw chart of all of the devices which are sending back to the configurations or sending back their heartbeat saying, you know, this is who I am, this is where I am, um, do you need me to do anything? So you can see even then that he starts with 140,000, you know, he dips, maybe some of the phones were uh, cleaned up. Can't read that, I'm sorry. Oh, move the mic forward? Yeah, just the tip of There? There you go. Sorry. So, yeah, so maybe some of the devices have been cleaned up, or maybe they went out of range, or whatever. It's a case where, um, again, he's just, you know, he has all of this infrastructure set up to help him track exactly what's going on in his botnet. So then these are actual revenue generation numbers. And as I said, all of the infected devices, they were basically programmed to constantly send back uh, feedback on how they were doing. So in this case, this is raw numbers of 
the amount of revenue generation activities that actually succeeded or like we'll say they got together their time slices on their telephones or something like that or they definitely um, sent a, a SMS message to one of these premium formats. So if you see down here then the IBR on um, you know, the 1st of February 2012 he basically had 3,000 active devices which successfully made a phone call to one of his premium services for 80 seconds. And then you see up here and then I believe this is the Han province he had, let's say, 10,000 devices, which managed to send off a premium SMS message. And again, this is all in one day. So overall, at the end of his, you know, at the end of the 1st of February of 2012, he actually had almost 28,000 revenue generating, um, revenue generation activities that fully succeeded. So it's a case where, if you begin to do even kind of simple maths, and we, we kind of, kind of optimistically say this, that, Every single one of his uh, transactions made him one dollar. Well, then, like you're talking about twenty-eight thousand dollars per day times three six five. You know, he's talking about ten million dollars. And in reality, it doesn't actually work like that. Um, these services they don't really cost them as much as that in China. Now, relatively, it's you know it works out in a similar kind of way. But it's a case where you could say maybe even one tenth of that would probably be a little bit more realistic. So maybe making one million dollars per year. But again, this is only from one specific piece of code that he managed to spam out on enough of uh, these third-party marketplaces to get enough devices actually infected. So again, he's doing quite well for himself uh, just by kind of writing this type of malware. Again, there are some more kind of caveats with that because again, China, this is such a big problem in China, they are kind of looking into it and they do investigate uh, these type of fraud reports. So it's a case where he could be charged back, maybe he doesn't make absolutely every single penny, but maybe some people are kind of coming back with um, fraud reports and you know, he's going to be charged back. But for the most part, he's doing, you know, he's doing quite well out of, out of his kind of simple law. So then, just kind of simple conclusions then, based on everything we've had a look at. Like, this type of Android malware, it's, you know, it's really, really simple to kind of disseminate. So this really wide user base, and especially if you kind of target it geographically, as this guy clearly did, uh, you know, you can make sure that you kind of go in with a really clear preconception of all of the type of devices that you expect to infect. And that there are absolutely massive markets for those type of malware writers, especially yet again, like we were saying, if you kind of target these kind of emerging markets where um, the user base is, is more vulnerable to this type of infection. And as we saw then, the potential revenue for these type of things, you know, it's up there in the millions of dollars. Again, it's it, it's just kind of a side effect of the markets themselves that they are able to kind of do this. And one of the we'll say one of the things you might wonder about is, okay, well, why don't we see this type of thing here? Well, we actually kind of have a lot of implicit protections and explicit protections. It's a case where we'll say a lot of people would get most of their software from these uh, places like Google Play, which are really really good at catching this type of software, and the laws kind of surround this type of fraud, they're a lot more strict here. Um, I don't actually remember the case, but there was a, quite a high profile case in the UK a few years ago, as far as I remember, where someone was prosecuted for doing something very similar to this. But like, again, that type of thing just doesn't really exist in China or India, or at least it didn't when I first looked into it, maybe the situation has changed. So we'll say in this kind of situation, you can ask, well, you can really see the motivation behind why someone would actually uh, go after something like this, okay? So in that case then, are there any more questions? Yeah, sure. So is the only way to, uh, for, for a device to get infected with this virus to download that app to your chart stack? Uh, well, not just that app. So again, you, you would absolutely need to download one of the apps and execute it and try to get it onto your phone that way. Yeah. But again, so I mean that he actually had hundreds of thousands of people downloading the virus. Not just one specific app. So we'll say, the actual infection cycle, the way it works, is he basically goes after as many apps as he can find that aren't available, let's we'll say, in the simplified Chinese. He's going to throw the case on the local item in the simplified Chinese, and then he's going to add his malicious code. And then basically it becomes a numbers game. So he just basically starts spamming them back to these third party marketplaces. And as many, you know, obviously, then as many APKs as he actually manages to infect, the better his chances are of getting someone to download and execute these applications. So I can actually show it, I can kind of go back and show his management interface where he's kind of listing, okay, well, for this uh, specific version of my RAT, 
I know it's in, let's say, uh, this specific package, and then from there you'd be able to, you could go back and find how many specific APKs actually have this package as part of their overall um, their overall structure. So again, you could almost kind of go back and try and find specific metrics on exactly how many applications is you know, going to affect with this specific number. But you're, you're right, like it's not just one application, like it's a numbers game. Oh, so um, say one of the devices that was infected had an antivirus mm -hmm. installed and running, would it be able to detect it? Uh, it depends on the antivirus. <laughs> it's semantic, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you initially detect the virus? Um, we'll say if we've never seen it before, yeah. yeah. So uh, that's kind of that's kind of my job a little bit. It's a case where so we have a number of different ways to do it. Um, then that a lot of your programming in Android, you can do the job, right? And then you can actually kind of compile it to the specific uh, formats that actually run in um, the Android platforms themselves. So there are also reverse engineering tools, and they're freely available. Like um, what I meant for was, how did it initially get discovered? Oh, OK. So, sorry. <laughs> um, I don't think it's too long. Yeah, that's funny. It's so, um, yeah. part of our kind of trend tree collection. When you install one of our applications on your mobile phone, you're asked if you want to send some of the information back so that we can use as part of our AV detection system. So when you uh, install it, it will get an idea of the type of application you have on your phone, and it will submit some of the more suspicious ones to us so that it doesn't see the normal third party, the not the non third party uh, markets. And then they'll get submitted to us, and then we can pick them up and start analyzing them. And if you find something that's really suspicious, then we'll obviously add text. Yes, yeah, so is that true? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, with the moving away from the dark VM to uh, a pre compiled um, Android OS, do you see this going away, or do you just see people kind of um, just circulating the new way of running applications on the Android platform? So that's a, that's a good question, actually. So it's a case where a lot of times you kind of hear various press releases from different companies and they'll say, okay, because now we've done this, you know, this type of malware is a thing of the past. And as far as I've seen it, that has never actually been the case. It's a case where the malware authors, they, they tend to do their level best to keep themselves in business. Yeah, they tend to be ahead of the curve. Yeah, a little bit. So like they'll say, the people who are probably most interested in those type of newer, newer techniques, we'll say for, I mean, we're running code on new platforms, like a lot of them will be malware writers on this first and foremost because again, they need to keep themselves in business and they need to see exactly, they need to basically keep the rest of everything which is actually happening, right? Yeah. So, uh, it's a good question. You mentioned like kind of how much revenue you was getting, well, can you estimate what like the style cost of that before that would, that, that would be? Good question. So, when I was kind of looking back to the source code again, which is kind of, it's a little bit easier for, let's say, those type of uh, Android applications because we can just use those reverse engineering tools which give us back a similar type of uh, Java code to maybe what was originally written. And you can even see it on, let's say, this front end, where you see he had like, specific keywords written in English, right? So I began to wonder if the person behind the actual, let's say, the command and control interface was the same person who actually wrote the code or was it the case where he subcontracted that out to someone else because a lot of what I saw in the APKs themselves, they, there was just a little bit too much English in it. Um, so it made me kind of suspect that maybe he had outsourced that and he said, this is kind of what I need, and maybe uh, hired someone to do that type of uh, development for him. But what we say in actual, if he had done all the development himself, the actual, let's say, outlay, I would say would be quite small and absolutely insignificant to the amount of money that he was actually making. Uh, from, let's say, the overall botnet itself. But yeah, I mean, Google was an interesting thing because the whole setup just kind of seemed a little bit more professional than I would usually expect. But again, you know, it was obviously paying him to be professional, so. But again, I would say it was, it was uh, um, quite a small initial effort. I think Guillaume has a couple of questions from IRC. Yeah. Hang on. 
accessible marketplaces in Europe, so not that I know of, but I, I could be wrong. So as far as I know. Uh, Fun was wondering how paranoid should he be, and what the best way to protect himself? Well, he needs to install all semantic products immediately. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, it's kind of a, just a, like a really simple obfuscator. I'm not sure if you can see that, definitely not on the screen, probably. Um, where it's a case where he's basically mindled up all of the names, and you know, it becomes quite difficult even if you're using something like JD GUI, or if you really wanted to, you could probably even try to load into Eclipse to actually work out exactly what's where, because basically all you see is single letters for classes and functions and that sort of thing, so it becomes quite difficult to read. But there are, there are uh, remappers which will basically allow you to create configurations and say, okay, well, when you see you know, a.b.c.x.z, call it this instead, you know, that sort of way. But again, that's extremely time consuming, and like, unless you were kind of really into doing deep analysis of these type of malware, you wouldn't, you wouldn't really go that route, because again, it's gonna do it for you. You still have to sit down and invest quite a lot of you know, uh, man time into actually uh, making the, the source even readable. Um, I was just looking at, I thought of the obfuscation and how Ray sure. and John C. Um, but how available are the libraries and the obfuscators for, for Java or other environments or for any new Java? Are they as competent as some stuff for BB or C? Or is there, are there other ones that would stand out in your mind as being very good at, at doing the obfuscation of, of Java? At doing raw the obfuscation? Yeah. Uh, not, that I, not that I was able to find when I was first looking into this, because that would have been very useful. But uh, as far as I remember, it was, it was quite a manual yeah. job. Um, uh, do you see people obfuscating with even better libraries or just obfuscating with more common thing now in, in more advanced botnets and more advanced uh, target or attacks? Uh, do you mean specifically in Android, Java, or do you mean C, C++? If we're talking, let's just say if we're talking Android and Java, I don't see plans. C is really heavily obfuscated and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, like it's, it's kind of, it's almost down to it's almost down to the preference of say the distributor of the malware itself, right? So there are some pretty good um, there are some pretty good Android uh, Spali obfuscators as well, as far as I remember. But um, if you kind of go down the, the route of C, then there are some there's some really terrible ones, <laughs> you know, which are extremely difficult to, to do pretty much anything with, yeah. uh, which I'm not going to mention. You know. <laughs> So you mentioned that when you kind of discovered the botnet at first, that you kind of moved to like the to a different server with a different address. Like that. Does that stop your investigation completely? That you can't trace the botnet anymore, or is there anything else you can do after that point? Yeah. So that's again a good question. So like we kind of have our we have our kind of um, our standard set of guidelines that we kind of go through because obviously when we find these things, our main our main idea is basically shut it down and try and make life as as difficult as possible. But like. It's not a case where I can spend weeks on something. 
like in, the, in a lot of cases, we kind of need to justify where we're going to even spend more than a few hours on a particular case because we tend to get quite a few and we need to kind of work through them. And, and that's why we have our specific set of steps, right? So, but like in specific, in certain cases, then if we can prove why you want to spend more time, uh, we can do that. But if it's a case where we're going to try and chase around someone, you know, for weeks and potentially over many, many different uh, IPs, and especially in a um, location like China, where it might be very difficult for us to do any kind of um, active law enforcement around what they're doing. Like again, you have kind of other. Um, There are other kind of situations where it's easier to do that type of thing. It's, it's a little bit more difficult in places like uh, China or Russia. I think in the past, when we call that to the malware security, which I think is the error, particularly in the last point before you move on, where in my role, I actually get someone who needs to come in here to track the groups and set malware within the structure to keep control of the groups and I where they're going and what they're doing. So like you might get the start of it where you can get quite some information. Yeah. Then if we each think it's um, worthwhile <coughs> to groups, we can then further um, invest a lot more time, invest a lot more effort into tracking groups to find out what they're doing more than they can do. And then you do some like trend analysis and see how we can do the Exactly. Yeah. Cool. It just takes way longer to do the same job. It's just not as much as you That's very good. Uh, so we, we have a, a request from Lobby and uh, Ian, would you stand up in front of the class just for a moment? First things first, a round of applause for you all here. So, um, just by, by popular demand, um, and because we made an absolute balls the last time. Um, um, how do you pronounce um, the nickname name that you mispronounced? Um, it's pronounced Hawk, apparently, which I did not realise. Yeah, so, <laughs> and I apologise to him there you for go. butchering your username. Thank you, Ian. Thank you.